Hello there, Evie here. Welcome to a time where somebody thought it would be appropriate to smack a rock with a piece of steel. Anyway, welcome to an air cool build in the Thermal Take Versa H15. Uh, I'm going to keep this intro nice and short. We'll jump straight into the build. I uh, hope you enjoy the video. Uh, if you do, you like it enough, uh, feel free to check out any of my other content, such as the last air cooled and water cooled builds in the top right hand corner. And uh, feel free to subscribe if you uh, fancy seeing more like it. So let's crack on with the build. I hope you enjoy. So let's start off by going through the list of components. First up we have the MSI Z170M mortar for our motherboard with the Intel i7-6700K inside. Next we have 24 gigs of RAM made up of two 8GB G-Skill Ripjaws 5 sticks and two sticks of 4 gig Crucial Ballistics. Mounted atop the i7-6700K is the Cooler Master Hyper 212 EVO Tower Cooler with two EK Varda F4 120ER fans attached. As requested by previous viewers, this has all been pre-assembled so we can get stuck into checking out more of the Versa H15's features. For the graphics card, we're using the R9390X, great for testing thermals on later. And to power it all, we have the Be Quiet Dark Power Pro 11 750W 80 Plus Platinum Power Supply. For storage, we have a 14mm 2.5 inch hard disk drive, a 7mm 2.5 inch hard disk drive and a 2.5 inch SSD. To add to our cooling, we'll be using an extra two EK Vardo F4 120ERs for standard thermal testing. And for the maximum cooling testing, we'll be using an extra two fans on top of those to fill every fan slot in the case. And finally, to control all of these fans, we have the Silverstone 1-8 Fan Hub. So with all of that out of the way, we can move on to checking out and building in the Thermaltake Versa H15. Typically, at this price point, we have the hard foam packaging and this case is surrounded by a plastic bag. Taking a quick first look, you can see this case has a simplistic design with a fully ventilated front panel and a moderately sized side panel window. There are two nicely located power and hard disk drive LED indicators which are positioned in the bezel directly above the 5.25 inch drive slot. The front panel features a quite large and in my opinion unattractive brand logo. And you can see the top panel is ventilated to support a maximum of two 120mm fans. The other side panel has a modest protruding section to help with cable management. And the rear shows a bottom supported power supply unit with a top mounted motherboard. To access the inside and provided screws and extras we need to remove the two thumb screws from the rear. You can see here the side panel has questionable rigidity but for the price point it does the job well enough. Removing the other side panel takes the removal of another two thumb screws. However this panel seems to have much stronger rigidity. Know that this case has a non-windowed version if the panel rigidity is more important to you than the side window. We can strip the interior quite extensively by first removing the 3.5 inch drive cage. And we can go a step further by removing the top 5.25 inch drive cage by removing a total of 6 screws. The front panel comes off quite easily by pinching a set of plastic clips on one side, and the other side pops off afterwards with a little encouragement. With the chassis completely stripped out, we can take a look around this case's features, first looking at the rear cable management support. The front can support a maximum of two 120mm fans and a top mounted 5.25 inch drive. And the rear houses an included Thermaltake 1225 3 pin fan and punch out style rear I.O. covers which I would have a big issue with if this case costed a lot more. Looking into the included extras, we have a rather basic but decent manual and a fair amount of screws. I didn't think it could be a full video of this case if we didn't take a look at all of them. If you really want to count them all, you can pause this shot. And there are also four included zip ties, two pairs of three and a half inch drive brackets and a single rear IO replacement cover panel. Now onto the building portion of the video. First I'm starting with the power supply unit. Feeding the bunch of required cables into the first slot started off my assessment of the case. Due to the larger than standard size ATX power supply unit, I have needed to pull my cables out and put them into the larger slot further down. This began the thoughts that this case could perhaps work better with smaller components. Anyway, looking to the rear of the case, I noticed I couldn't get the screws through to the power supply unit. I soon realised this case will only support a fan side down configuration, which tarnished my fan setup I had in mind. Next we can screw in all the standoffs required to support the motherboard. This is a simple task but please take note of the position of the cable management slots before the motherboard is lowered into position. We of course can't forget to fix the rear I.O. shield into position which takes a few taps along each edge. Lowering the motherboard, again take note of the cable management slots. 
Notice that this is a Micro ATX motherboard that covers them all up. This reinforces the thought from earlier of perhaps smaller components, maybe a mini ITX motherboard, may suit this case better. Then the motherboard can be secured in place with the provided screws. I wanted to show this slot designed to line up with the side of the motherboard and its connectors. Maybe this will make up for the covered cable management slots. Aside the motherboard, there is a panel that can support a couple of 2.5 inch hard disk drives or SSDs. My initial plan is to secure all three drives to this panel in one form or another. So, I've got a thicker 14mm hard disk drive to the rear, and I'm positioning the other 7mm hard disk drive to the front. Excuse the steel washers, they will get replaced later. Since the two 2.5 inch slots are taken up, I went for the it's okay to use double sided tape to mount an SSD approach. After connecting the motherboard power connector, it took a long time to figure out a relatively neat setup for the SATA power connectors to the drives. Due to the way that the SATA power connectors connect to the drives, they needed to be looped in a very unusual fashion. In order to get the bulk of the connectors through to the rear of the case, the motherboard had to be unscrewed from the standoffs so it could be shifted across by a few millimetres. The connection of the SATA data connectors to the drives took a slightly more drastic approach. I needed to cut away as much sleeving from a SATA data connector as possible to allow it to fit between all of the other components. You can see compared to a standard connector, the bulk of the plastic has been removed in order to create a connector that has much more reach and is impacted less by the other components which you can see here. Now we need to connect the front I.O. This case has a USB 2 connector, mic and speaker jacks, power and reset buttons, hard disk drive LEDs and power LEDs, and a USB 3.0 connector. I found these were cable managed best through the rear slot which wouldn't be available if the 5 and a quarter inch drive was still in place. Then down the back tied to the cable management loops available, then looped through the large slot at the bottom, and then finally to their respective connectors. Next we have to install the fans. The front two are extremely simple to connect since the mounting positions are open and accessible. Once in place, the cables can be routed around the back where I've wire tied the fan hub to the 5.25 inch drive slot. The top fans are just as simple, apart from the CPU cooler being in the way this time, but it's not too hard to work around. Now for a touch of cable management at the bottom of the case. Since there's no basement cover, it's good to keep these as neat as you can. So, we're heading towards the end of the build. The last major component to install is the GPU. After punching out the PCI Express covers, it didn't take too long to work out that the SSD cannot be located in its current position. So, it needed to be relocated around the back of the motherboard tray. It would have been nice to see some screw holes here specific to mount in the drive, but double-sided tape will do. Now we can collision-free slot the GPU into position, and secure it into its position with the screws provided. You may be able to make out the protective sheet to the right which is preventing scratches to the case that could be caused by the GPU. Once secured, it's a simple case of connecting the power in a way that doesn't look terrible like my first attempt to use a velcro strap. And then we can move on to some finishing touches. The LED lighting strip was not an issue for the majority of the case. The front strip sat perfectly down beside the front fans and continued to run across the bottom without any issues. However, with the rear fan installed, the lighting strip cannot make it through to the top of the case. And with two top mounted fans, you won't be able to mount any LED strips up there either, more on that in a bit. Replacing the front panel was relatively pain free, but the tolerance to the Hyper 212 EVO is extremely tight, so I couldn't suggest any cooler that is larger. Replacing the other side panel was much harder. The tolerance was so tight that I had to remove the wire tie that held the fan hub in place as it was preventing the clips at the front of the panel latching into position. The amount of pop out on the panel doesn't help much with the main parts of cable management, which generally takes place around the edges of this case. Before we check out the final build, let's check out the thermal testing results. With just the two front case fans and the rear case fan, under the testing conditions you can see at the top of the page, the CPU maxed out at 86 degrees Celsius, and the GPU maxed out at 85 degrees Celsius. Compare this to previous cases I've tested, and you can see that this stacks up very well. I feel this may be down to a combination of the full front ventilation and the light front foam filtering. However, adding two extra fans to the top seemed to help the CPU reduce its max temperature by over 3 degrees, but the GPU increased its temperature by 5 degrees. 
I tried both two intakes, two exhausts and one intake and one exhaust for the top two fans, but the later one turned out to be the best result. This increase in GPU temperature is likely caused by the top fans trapping air in the case, creating a lot of turbulence, but not a lot of airflow. Remove the top two fans for the best result, and then you can replace them with the LED lighting strip that you couldn't place in there earlier. So here is how it compared to the other cases tested so far. You can see it's not performing as well as its previous test. I'm going to stay quiet for a minute or so so you can enjoy some of the visuals. I'll catch you at the end for a wrap up. So you can take the build, my comments and the test results and hopefully work out whether this case is right for you. I'd like to say thank you so much for checking out this video, I hope you found it very useful and informative. If you enjoyed it enough, please like the video and maybe consider subscribing for future videos like this, but with improvements added from your great feedback. I'll be away for a couple of weeks so the water cooling in this case will be delayed from the usual schedule, but please let me know if you have any cases you'd like to see in future videos and I'll add them to the list. Follow the channel on Twitter or Facebook if you'd like to see early updates on videos. And finally, thanks again for checking out the video and I'll catch you next time.